Thank you, Reeves. I, I want to assure you, his intelligence is entirely real. That's the computer that's completely artificial. <laughs> so <clears throat> I want to I start with a statistic that I, that I heard recently uh, that really captured my imagination. Uh, UNESCO estimates that in the next 30 years, we will educate more people than we have in the entire history of the human race. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a completely mind-boggling statistic to me. But the reason that's possible is because I will at least submit. I will submit that the reason that's possible is because of advances in computing, uh, primarily, and communication, of course. And computing can, at this point in time, uh, deliver education to the farthest corners of the world. And it can, uh, it can also allow you to find information. There's democratization of information, find information from everywhere. But most importantly, and what we're just scratching the surface of at this point in time, is its ability to engage people. So I want to start with a, uh, with a story. Are there science fiction fans here in the audience? Uh, hands up. Yeah. Great. <laughs> and so uh, how many of you have heard of the book uh, Neuromancer by William Gibson? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> uh, my, my, my talk is done. It's this is easy. <laughs> So, uh, so the story behind William Gibson and Neuromancer is, uh, in 1984, uh, IBM had just come out with the PC. The PC was about three, four years old. Uh, the Macintosh computer was invented. And William Gibson was a young writer. He didn't actually have a computer at that point in time. Uh, and he'd, he'd only written a few short stories. He hadn't yet written a novel. And the short stories were very, uh, very captivating. So they asked him to write a novel. And he was uh, a little bit uh, in a funk. He was like, what do I write about? So he happened to be in Toronto, walking down the, the streets of Toronto, and he looked into a store window, and there was a video game arcade. Uh, do people here remember Space, uh, Space Invaders, Pac-Man, yeah. right? So he saw a bunch of kids, a bunch of teenagers playing it, and what he observed was uh, they were completely captivated. They were oblivious to their surroundings. And, uh, and so that imagery stayed with him, and it inspired him to write Neuromancer, uh, which turned out to be one of the most influential books of the last generation. And in fact, the whole genre of cyber fiction was spawned off from Neuromancer. The word cyberspace comes from there. And virtual reality, the Matrix movies, all of these owe a huge debt of allegiance to, to Mr. Gibson. But most importantly, what he was really pointing to was the ability of computing to engage people in a way that it's, uh, nothing else has engaged us in the past. And so, so the premise today um, is very simple, um, right? Uh, can we take that, that ability of computers to engage, and can we create uh, very engaging learning experiences, and in the process, uh, you know, help a whole generation of people uh, uh, educate themselves in a, in, a, in a much better way than we have uh, in the history of, uh, of the human race? So that's kind of the, the broad theme of this talk. Uh, I want to be humble and recognize that we're taking very, very, very tiny steps at this point in time. Uh, but if we start here, we will create a generation of uh, learners who will be capable of doing things that I can't imagine, that, that we can't imagine, because they will be different from us. So, so to answer this question, I want to just take a quick trip back through history very quickly um, and talk a little bit about you know, what kinds of learning tools were available in the history of the human race. And uh, so if you go back to a time before history, prehistoric times, uh, the way we primarily learned was through storytelling, through oral storytelling, games, et cetera. And you could kind of start talking about formal history as, you know, or at least formal learning as uh, uh, having started with the Platonic Academy uh, at the time of Socrates and Plato in uh, 387 BC. Uh, but in reality, in terms of uh, learning tools, nothing much happened for a long time. We had, sure, we invented the abacus and, and uh, things like the, uh, the, pa the paper and the horn book, et cetera. But till the start of the Industrial Revolution, things were very static. And at the start of the Industrial Revolution, uh, over the, the, the next 50 years of the Industrial Revolution, computing got invented. And that was, uh, or at least that to me, uh, was, a, was a huge uh, uh, tipping point. So with the birth of computing, and especially with the birth of, uh, or the emergence of the internet, uh, and the democratization of information, we are now at a point in time where everybody, everywhere on the planet, can have access to information. That's never happened before. So the whole notion of who's an expert and expertise is slowly disappearing into the, into the ether. 
But more importantly, uh, as the internet was born and as the internet expanded, computing itself ca ca kept evolving. And it evolved to a point where, uh, you know, uh, our ability to communicate with computers became very, very easy, very native, very intuitive in many ways. And that really, was, so the iPhone, for instance, the in introduction of the iPhone was a huge uh, tipping point again. Uh, because my four-year-old daughter, my eight year old grandfather, all the people who couldn't access high-powered computing can access it now at their fingertips. So that was massive. And at the same time, very quickly, we started being able to speak to computers. And then we had the IBM Watson system that uh, answered questions and spoke in natural language and understood natural language. So all these things happen in a very, very short period of time. And, and so one of the points here to make is that as humans, uh, we experience time in a very linear fashion. So when something happens very rapidly, very non-linearly, it's very hard for us to wrap our heads around it. But we are at a point in time right now, uh, standing on the threshold at this point in time where computing is highly, deeply engaging, deeply interactive. So, so let me park that there for a second and talk a little bit about what's happening in, in related fields, uh, the field of learning sciences in general. So what do we know about how we learn? What do we know about who we are as a species? How do we, how do we take input and how do we create all these rules and abstractions in our head? So predominantly, what we know about us as a species comes from a group of brilliant psychologists, cognitive psychologists, starting with uh, Vygotsky, uh, who only lived for 40 years, but he had an immense impact in his 40 years, and Piaget and Bruner, all these guys came out with a bunch of very profound theories of learning that talk about how people learn. And, and so much of what we learn today, about uh, what we know today about how people learn, come from these, uh, these brilliant psychologists, and we owe a huge debt of gratitude to them. But they also were handicapped. They were handicapped in that these theories were predominantly empirical, and they could only do them on sh small, small sets of people at a time. They could take 20 students in one class, 20 students in another class, and do a bunch of experiments. So what's happened now is that suddenly, with the availability of online courses and MOOCs and everything else, you can now do experiments on hundreds of thousands of students and get statistically rigorous uh, proof about what works and what doesn't for all kinds of learners, people with uh, English as a second language, people with learning disabilities, people with, uh, uh, right, uh, with different cultural backgrounds. Every learner, every one of us is different. We all learn differently. And we're gonna have proof about how we learn. And again, allied to this, there's something extraordinary happening in the, in the neurosciences world. Uh, the Human Connectome Project, uh, it started about five years ago. It's uh, nearing its end. Uh, uh, what happened with the Human Connectome Project is that techniques advance to a point where people can start figuring out how the brain works. How does, what kinds of inputs uh, produce, what kinds of responses? How is it connected to each other? And then there's another project called the Brain Initiative, which talks about an even deeper level, at the neurosynaptic level, what's happening. So if you put all these together, over the next five to 10 years, we're going to know in very significant ways how people learn. And then if I marry that to computing and the ability of computing to entrance, to enhance, to, to engage you, uh, we are standing on the threshold of a, of a revolution that will transform the learning sciences and it'll transform learning. And that's what I'm, ex I'm very excited about. So we have to take some baby steps. Uh, so we understand all this. Where do we start? That's the question. So part of what we are trying to do uh, at IBM is uh, I've, I'm leading a team where we're trying to build a series of uh, what we call cognitive assistance for education. And uh, these two various things, uh, for instance, the, uh, the student advisor would be something that you would have in a university uh, where you would go to, uh, go, go to this uh, machine and ask it all kinds of questions. When does my semester start? Do I qualify for financial aid, et cetera? Then the cognitive tutor gets one level deeper. In fact, it's the, it's the most complex thing we're building. Uh, we intend to build this system that works with students and answers all kinds of questions about uh, their educational material. So for instance, a student would have questions about how do I solve this particular problem? And it wouldn't give him the answer, it would step him through the answer much the same way as a parent would to a child or as a teacher would to a, to a, to a student. And we intend this thing to be a supplement to teachers, helping teachers outside of the classroom educate their students. 
Uh, then the teacher advisor is a tool that we are building to help teachers themselves uh, adopt all the changes in the, in the landscape. The common core adoption in most of the states in the US, the TEKS standards here in Texas, uh, the uh, digitization of computing, the, the, the fact that computing tools are coming into the classroom. Teachers need help too. They need help in trying to figure out how to teach to students, how to teach to uh, students with learning disabilities and all kinds of students. So we're building a teacher advisor. And finally, a career advisor is kind of this tool that will stay with you through your journey as a student and help you figure out what kinds of jobs you should aspire for, what kinds of careers you should do. And these are all baby steps. I can imagine much more complex things we can do, but we're just trying to figure out how do I take intelligent computing and marry it to information and create some engaging learning experiences. So I'm going to play a short video now about the teacher advisor. So this is a tool that we just built. We built it over the last six months. And uh, it's, a, it's still in a prototype stage. We will be releasing it. Uh, uh, we will be piloting it about this time next year and releasing it to teachers uh, in the US uh, about a year, for, a year from then. We intend this to be a philanthropic offering from IBM. And what you see here is still, again, uh, there's, it's still somewhat handicapped in that there aren't all the features that we hope to have uh, in here. But I'll, I'll walk you through them in a couple of minutes. So can we play the video, please? <clears throat> can we back up uh, the sound associated with the video? Okay, I, uh, something happened to the sound. Okay, well, I'll, I'll talk you through this. So in this uh, video, uh, Watson's being asked uh, what close reading means by a, uh, an elementary school teacher. And the teacher is getting a, a high quality answer from Watson. And the teacher also has the ability to go look at a video of another teacher who's teaching this particular concept uh, to her. So on demand, she's getting a video related to a question that she has. So on the right-hand side, uh, you'll see that at the next question, which is a fairly complex question. So on the right-hand side, you will see that uh, there are also these concepts that are related to the central concept that the teacher is interested in, uh, that Watson's automatically pulling out. And, uh, and it's also giving you some evidence about where it's getting the answers from, et cetera. Now, the formatting could use help. Uh, but in this particular uh, system with Watson, what we haven't yet done is built a system to ask a question back off the teacher. So when Watson doesn't know the answer, uh, the system that we'll be piloting next year will be able to throw an answer back to the teacher and say, can you rephrase it? Can you, can you qualify the question? If it still doesn't get the answer, it'll go and pull it, uh, it'll go and push the answer to a human to bring the human back into the loop. So this is basically what we're attempting to build. And uh, the human would be another teacher who's teaching roughly the same grade, the same topic, the same subject, et cetera. And it's basically an example of a, an intelligent machine that understands questions in natural language. The teacher can type a question in whatever language that, uh, whatever uh, you know, uh, fashion they want to with colloquialisms, slang, et cetera. At two in the morning, the thing will be there for them answering questions. So, the <clears throat> so, uh, so, so I want to now end my talk with a quick nod to, uh, to something that's inspired me throughout my whole career. Uh, which is Star Trek. Are there Star Trek fans in here? <laughs> Great. <laughs> um, so uh, there's something called the Star Trek effect. Um, so the Star Trek effect is this notion that uh, you know, young people watch, watch Star Trek, and they get inspired by this future vision. And a bunch of us become technologists. And we say, we want to actually build that world. Right? We want, and so the Motorola cell phone that came out, the flip phone, was actually very closely related to the communicator that Captain Kirk had in, in the first version of Star Trek. Um, a more profound uh, thing that happened recently in 94, uh, you know, there, there was this whole discussion about is, are warp drives possible? Is it possible for us to go faster than the speed of light? And so in 1994, uh, a Mexican physicist called Alcubierre took a look at Einstein's uh, uh, relativity equations. And he discovered that under certain conditions, actually, it's theoretically possible, if you have negative energy and dark matter, 
uh, to contract space in front of you and to expand space behind you and to create a bubble that would travel faster than the speed of light. Now, of course, we can't build it now. We probably can't build it for many generations uh, to come. But the point is, it was, it was this really profound uh, thought that he had that, you know, I want to figure out, you know, whether this future is possible. So, I mean, that got me thinking as well. What is the Star Trek vision of learning? What will learning look like 100 years from now? How will we learn, right? Uh, so, of course, I turned to Star Trek for inspiration. Um, in the latest version of, in the latest movie, Star Trek, there's this uh, scene where a young Spock is sitting there immersed in this uh, medium, and, and it's asking him questions, it's visually immersive, it's interactive, it's taking his answers, and, uh, and it's hel helping him learn, right? So, so can we build it? And, and the answer is yes, and actually it's a lot closer than, than, than we realize. Uh, virtual reality is knocking at our doorsteps, uh, and uh, so I want to give a quick shout out to my friend, uh, Professor Jeremy Balenson at Stanford University, who's uh, pioneering the use of VR and learning. Uh, and we're talking about marrying Watson and virtual reality in a, in a learning setting. And, uh, and, and then there's, uh, I, I'm sure the fans of Minority Report, the movie here, uh, the, the visual gesture interfaces from Minority Report are also uh, on our doorstep. So if you marry all these together, uh, I believe uh, that uh, we have the possibility to teach kids in, in a deeply engaging way. And as an example, imagine learning about Roman history by going back into ancient Rome and walking through the reconstruction of Rome. Or imagine learning about astronomy or the solar system by flying through the solar system and, and learning about the planets and the satellites and geology, astrogeology, et cetera. So that to me is a vision uh, for how the future of learning could evolve. And, uh, and we hope to take that and to build something along those lines and to make it available for learners everywhere. So with that, I end my talk. Thank you. Thank you.